Hello, everybody, and welcome um, to SDSN's Spatial Planning and Low Carbon Transitions webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Um, quick background on SDSN. We are um, a global network of academic and knowledge producing institutions. We have over 1,400 members across 34 national and regional networks. Um, and in 2018, our SDSN USA network launched. Um, and over the last year, they have been working on a US Pathways project. Um, earlier this spring, we published two reports, one on the Midwest and one on the Southeast United States. Um, these reports asked, uh, how does the physical infrastructure in these regions need to evolve in order to enable the low carbon transition? And also, what are the key opportunities and challenges in those regions? Uh, later this summer, we'll also be presenting a national level study where we're modeling the transition at the national level. Um, and alongside this work, realizing the massive expansion of renewables that the uh, transition will require, we've started working with Grace Wu um, to better understand the land use implications of expanding renewable energy and how to do it in an efficient, cost-effective, and environmentally friendly way. Um, so Grace Wu is joining us today. She is from the David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellow with the U Nature Conservancy and the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Um, Grace's research focuses on identifying and understanding the co-benefits and trade-offs between climate change mitigation strategies, including renewable energy development, other human land uses, and habitat conservation. Um, so before I introduce, uh, welcome Grace into the webinar, just some housekeeping. Um, you will all remain muted today in our webinar. However, we will have a Q&A session towards the end. So if you have questions for Grace as she's presenting, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll work to get through most of them. Um, also in your control panel right now, you should see a few handouts. We've put Grace's paper um, on the spatial planning for the low carbon transition, and also the Midwest and Southeast report that I mentioned earlier. Um, this webinar will also be published on SDSN's YouTube site later today. So if you wanna share it with colleagues, we encourage you to do so. Um, and also we'll be sharing Grace's presentation. We've, we put it actually in the chat box there. So if you're having any issues connecting, please follow along on her presentation. Uh, without further ado, Grace, would you like to turn on your camera and join us? Sure. Perfect. Everyone, can you see me? Yep, you look good, go ahead. Hi, um, so thank you for that introduction, Elena, and for the invitation to present to the SDSN network. Um, I am going to give an, a very quick overview of the main contents of the chapter that Elena shared um, and with a particular focus on renewable energy, though, um, as the title claims, um, it is an overview of planning for low carbon transitions, um, including ag, forestry, and other land use sectors. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, please um, refer to the chapter itself. So, um, so I'll just get started because we want to leave enough time for Q&A um, near the end. Um, this is a quick overview of what I'll cover. Um, I will motivate the need for a topic like this and why spatial planning in particular is really critical for deep decarbonization planning um, and that we need to add more spatial specificity to a lot of the deep decarbonization studies we've already seen to date. Um, I'll provide a analytical framework for how we can do this. Um, as I said, mentioned earlier, there is a particular focus of this framework on renewable energy and in, and in and specifically on uh, utility scale wind and solar. Um, and I'll use a case study um, called the Power of Place uh, that looks ex specifically at California's deep decarbonization goals out to 2050. Um, and I'll summarize um, with some key messages as well as some recommendations for future work. So uh, let's start with trying to 
understand the scale of this challenge, this land use transition challenge that's associated with renewable energy development. This is a figure from um, Jim Williams and Evolved Energy's latest study that's um, currently in submission, um, but is, is currently in report form. Um, that was also done for SDSN uh, Deep Decarbonization's Pathways Project. Um, it's called Carbon Neutral Pathways for the US. And this figure shows um, the annual average capacity additions um, for every five years for renewables. And those yellow, um, blue, and green bars um, correspond to solar PV wind and offshore wind, onshore wind and offshore wind. Um, so as you can see, there's a tremendous growth in renewable energy additions that's necessary to achieve carbon neutral pathways for by mid-century for the US. Um, to give you a sense of the scale of that in terms of the land requirements, um, to take one of the lower end cases in terms of capacity additions, this is the central low fuel price case that corresponds to about almost a thousand megawatts of onshore wind and uh, I'm sorry, that should be gigawatts, a thousand gigawatts of onshore wind and 1,485 gigawatts of um, ground mounted solar PV. That uh, roughly corresponds to the state area equivalent for wind, including spacing between turbines um, of the area of New Mexico. And for solar PV, um, the area of New Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, and that does not include spacing between um, panels. Um, of course, that challenge that you see here on the left in the, the state equivalent figures um, is met by the fact that a lot of the land in the US has already been spoken for. Um, as this figure on the right shows uh, how the US, land in the US is currently being used. And that studies are anticipating energy sprawl as being one of the largest drivers of land use change in the US. Um, though historically it has been agricultural land use. And that though we are very much still on the cusp of a exponential growth in renewable energy development, we're already seeing quote unquote green civil war cases over utility scale wind and solar projects. Um, and this is a study that looks specifically at solar PV challenges on public lands in the, in the Southwest. And um, just to, just to um, caveat the map that you see on the left, it does not include um, any of the other capacity requirements for other technologies required in those deep decarbonization pathways. And that does include any biomass for transportation fuels, um, any of the fracking wells that's necessary as a bridge fuel for natural gas, um, any additional hydropower, and any negative emissions technologies, including VEX, all of which require additional land. Um, so another question that uh, uh, a lot of energy planners often want to understand is how important is siting as a barrier compared to other challenges to renewable energy development? Um, unfortunately, there aren't very, very few studies on that actually quantify this barrier. Um, here I list several major headliners um, as anecdotal evidence that siding has been a barrier, um, though we have very few installations relative to what we need to achieve by 2050. Um, and this has been often been referred to as green versus green battles when it's an environmental, when um, the clashes are with environmental organizations and with wildlife. Um, and increasingly, the last two headlines you see on the bottom are starting to highlight um, food versus energy conflicts um, throughout the US, uh, East and West Coast. Um, so there's definitely a solar versus um, prime farmland conflict that we're starting to see crop up. Um, and as I mentioned, there are very few quantitative studies examining this question of what the drivers of project failure are. 
Um, there are two that I'm citing here, and there's a, one more that's in the chapter. For California, they found um, st authors have found that up to 40% of all failed renewable energy contracts were due to siting and permitting, um, though this is um, from a much earlier decade. Um, and the latest study to look at this, uh, which is currently still under review, um, but the report is available, um, looks at the benefits of low risk siting. And they found that looking at just wind development in the farm, in the wind belt, that 50%, uh, I'm sorry, projects were 50% less likely to be canceled when they're located in a low risk area. And by low risk, um, the study is referring to this area in the map you see um, of the of wind air potential areas in the Great Plains. And this is from the site win rate analysis and study that pre predates um, this particular uh, cancellation study. And they also found that when um, projects receive higher positive publicity, they found a 25% uh, decrease in the likelihood of cancellation as well. Um, and so social receptivity and potential wildlife conflict in, in terms of low risk do lead to more favorable and successful um, wind development outcomes. Um, and one important co um, consideration, and this is one of my last motivation slides, is um, how do we quantify the cost impacts of reciting restrictions on renewable energy and what are they importantly? So that, that as can be used as a proxy for understanding the importance of siting as a barrier, um, not just um, on the ground, but potentially in the long term, especially with large scale, um, highly ambitious renewable energy development by mid-century. This is a study that um, NREL published in 2016. Um, as it, It's one of the very few. There are just a handful of studies looking at this question. Um, they looked at the incremental cost of installing the first 1,000 gigawatts of developable wind potential in the US um, based on the combined moderate and siting consideration representations. And these restrictions, these siting restrictions, do include wildlife radar and distance to human settlement. So both environmental and social siting restrictions. And those, you see the, the divergence of these two lines um, and it shows the cost increases in levelized cost of electricity on the y-axis. So as you can see, the more capacity that's developed, the um, greater the divergence of those two scenarios. So the greater the cost increases and the higher um, and more severe the impacts of siting restrictions are on levelized cost. Um, in terms of what the outcome is for development uh, so our system costs, this, uh, an additional study, not for the US, but for the UK and um, out to 2050, so a, another deep decarbonization study, has shown that land availability for both onshore wind and solar could lead to cost increases of 13% just for land restrictions alone. Um, and as a follow-up to the Tegan study, they did an analysis using capacity expansion model and found that the siting restrictions that you see here in the moderate scenario um, do increase system costs by 4% um, if we install just 400 gigawatts of wind, uh, which is only about a third or but between one half to one third of the, the wind that's needed by 2050, depending on the scenario. So those that uh, cost burden would increase to achieve um, those highly ambitious goals and does not include any restrictions on solar. Okay, and with that, um, I'm going to uh, describe in some detail a case study that um, I worked on with the Nature Conservancy and um, a consulting think tank called E3. And uh, we, as I said earlier, we did this for the state of California, looking at um, a bill called SB 100. Um, and I should also mention that um, it, this case study is br described briefly in the chapter. And if you want to learn more, um, 
dive into the details, there's a journal paper that's published. Um, the link is provided as well as a detailed report um, that's uh, focused on California assumptions and geared for towards California decision makers. So what is a spatial electricity planning framework? Um, the way that I've defined it here is that it's an analytical planning framework that should estimate possible land use requirements of energy infrastructure, um, land use impacts of infrastructure, and importantly, land use constraints on energy infrastructure. And um, in addition to those, how all these factors could affect the electricity system costs and other key considerations that um, traditional energy planners would require in decision making um, in terms of procurement. So the motivation behind this study and the decision to come up with a analytical framework that examines this is really um, the passing of Senate Bill 100 in California in September of 2018. And Governor Brown signed a bill to, um, that would put California on a path to achieve 100% carbon free and renewable electricity by mid-century. Um, and this is a highly ambitious target, um, putting California on par with now several other states with very similar ambitious targets. So the, perp the goal of our work um, was to examine how natural and agricultural land protections and the availability of regional energy trade assumptions affect several factors. So how it um, uh, shapes the amount of renewable resources available for California, the optimal technology investments. So that means the balance of um, capacity between the te various technologies, primarily ground mounted solar PV and onshore wind um, alongside other technologies, balancing technologies like natural gas, hydropower, and geothermal. Um, importantly, the total electricity system costs, so these are costs that um, are borne by ratepayers. And finally, the social and ecological impacts due to possible land conversion from um, achieving SB100. So we took an approach um, that is akin to the integrated resource planning framework. And this is the approach that the California uh, regulator and utilities have adopted for the state um, and IRP approach. And so it starts with resource mapping. Um, in our case, on the supply side, um, we used a model to, to perform um, the analysis that allows us to estimate how much land is available for wind and solar development under particular assumptions. In the second step, we used um, the resource mapping outputs as an input to a capacity expansion optimization. And um, we used a model called Resolve that is the um, official IRP uh, decision support tool uh, for the state of California. And it is open source and open access. We took the outputs of Resolve and we spatially allocated or, or cited um, those portfolios that you see. Um, so that disaggregation of wind, solar, um, and geothermal, we put on the map, basically. And with those solar and wind footprints, we performed a strategic environmental assessment to get at that last question of what the ecological and possible social impacts are of each of those portfolios. So I'll go into um, a bit more detail on the steps and then show you some intermediate results. Um, just to provide some framing for um, these, the main scenarios, we chose a deep decarbonization pathway that um, is characterized by high electrification. And this is in contrast to alternative pathways like a high biofuels or high hydrogen pathway. Um, and this is the most likely outcome for the state of California. Um, in terms of cases and uh, sensitivities that we ran, I'll focus here in the presentation on the 
sighting levels um, or what we refer what we refer to as sighting levels, but are effectively land protection scenarios. Um, and then the geographic availability is the uh, amount of regional trade for energy um, and availability of out of state wind and solar uh, projects. Um, and I won't go into detail on the others, but we, we also ran several other sensitivity scenarios and those are all in the report. Um, so in terms of the study area and the geographic cases, um, so California, we looked at an in-state scenario, which California can only procure electricity from within the state. Um, there's a part west scenario, which we look at neighboring procurement from neighboring states and um, politically aligned states uh, with similar, similarly ambitious targets. And we also examine a full west or interconnected scenario, which um, we have access, California has access to um, high quality wind in Wyoming in particular. And in terms of the siding levels I mentioned earlier, which are, as I said, effectively uh, protected area scenarios, we came up with four categories of different levels of ecological and uh, protection for high conservation value areas. So the first category um, follows what typical, uh, what you would see in energy planning to date is everything that's legally protected is restricted from an, any energy development project. Um, that includes national parks, national wildlife refuges. Um, and in category two, we uh, called this the administratively protected areas because this category includes land, that would trigger an administrative review process if there were to be a proposal for energy development on that parcel of land. And that it does include wetlands, um, critical habitat for threatened and endangered species as well as tribal lands. Um, and in the third category, this category required um, a lot of data collecting from uh, every state uh, nature conservancy chapter in our study region um, and these are areas that don't have any legal protections, but are deemed by um, science, by ecologists um, and other conservation scientists to have high value for conservation. And the, I've listed uh, several examples below. And finally, in the last category, we looked at um, everything that's a, more of a landscape metric as opposed to a biological metric. Um, and the, those are connectivity, so wildlife corridors and areas that are deemed intact or less impacted. Um, to construct the siding levels, we basically overlaid these categories. Um, so siding level three does include categories one, two, and three. And so siding level four includes all four categories. Um, so these are the results of the first step, which is that resource mapping step in which we identified eligible and suitable areas for renewable energy development in the West. Um, and so this, I'll step through the next series of maps that show the, uh, how the, that availability changes under each of those four siding levels. This is siding level one, um, so legally uh, protected. This is signing level two, administratively protected. Three, um, and this high conservation value areas protected. And then finally four, which has uh, those landscape intactness areas protected. And so you can see there's still plenty of solar um, in every state in the West. And um, in terms of quantified or estimated availability that still exceeds, uh, vastly exceeds California's needs. These uh, are, the, are the similar maps but, uh, for wind potential. And so this is siding level one, legal, two, administrative, three, high conservation value, and finally four, which is the intact areas protected. Um, so as you can visibly tell, wind is a lot more um, spatially restricted um, and sensitive to those environmental protections than solar is 
um, and that an estimate of the availability really comes close to the California needs by the highest level of environmental protection. Okay, and in um, so in the next second step, we ran the capacity expansion model, which was uh, called Resolve. Um, and what Resolve does is it uh, is it produces least cost um, optimal portfolios for um, the amount of wind and solar and geothermal as well as conventional capacity that's required by 2050. Um, and so the results I'm showing here are the results, the total capacity requirements by 2050 for the state of California. Um, and so orient you on uh, the layout of all of these figures that I'll show on the, the three panels show the three geography scenarios and the X axis shows the environmental scenario. So those that space case has no, is basically an unmodified capacity expansion model. And then we use siding levels one through th uh, four on the X axis. Um, on the Y axis shows the capacity that's been selected by the capacity expansion model. So these lines show just the solar um, selected capacity. As you can tell, the trend is that the more um, uh, resources that are available from out of state, the less solar that's required by the state of California, um, and that environmental siting protections have a tendency to increase the reliance on solar technologies. And that's particularly true in, in the full West scenario. The opposite trend um, is shown for onshore wind. Typically with onshore wind, the further out west we go um, with more wind availability in uh, um, non-California states, there is a tendency to select more wind capacity by the model. And um, as you saw in those maps, the environmental protections do restrict the amount of wind available. And so you see a drop um, from left to right for, within each of the, the panels. Um, this is the amount of distributed PV that's required in each scenario. As uh, we go um, from left to right in on the x-axis, so more protections, there is a tendency to select more distributed PV, so that becomes economically competitive with utility scale, um, the more environmental restrictions there are. And um, in general, there is a lot more distributed PV in, in the in-state and part west scenarios compared to the full west. And then finally, this is uh, total selected renewable capacity. So this does include some geothermal um, that I don't specifically show. But the, the trend is generally, it generally holds that um, the further out west um, California can procure electricity, the less selected capacity that's required um, and that the selective capacity does increase as we increase the amount of land protections. Um, and this is what it looks like with all the technologies in place. Um, and we, so we find that overall environmental protections and geography do significantly shape the technology mix. Um, and if we look at corresponding system costs, uh, for so the, as I said, these are rate payer costs in 2016 dollars. Um, we can see that the the shape of those cost curves very much resemble the shape of those selected capacity curves, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the more uh, investments we make, the more it'll cost to rate payers. And uh, what's interesting to note with the red circles that you see is that in the in-state scenario with the base case, so that's actually applying no more than what is currently um, being protected in the modeling assumptions. It's actually more expensive to do a completely in-state scenario versus a full west um, at a much higher level of environmental protection, achieving siting level three, which protects all areas of high conservation value. So it's actually more cost effective to do regional energy procurement um, and protect land than to do than for California to procure in, um, uh, only within its state. So regional renewable planning do, that includes wind resources really sig significantly reduces costs as well as protects land. 
And in terms of storage, um, the storage numbers, and this is primarily battery storage, um, really closely track the trends in solar um, capacities selected, as you can tell. Um, so, th and that makes a lot of sense for balancing purposes. But uh, the reason I, I, I pulled out these numbers is to show that storage does play a significant role in um, driving the cost as well. And then finally, uh, we also modeled the footprint of transmission requirements for each of those portfolios, um, both the long distance or bulk transmission requirements, as well as the interconnection requirements uh, for addition, all the new capacity that's selected. Um, so the trend is, of course, that the further out west we go, the more we rely on this bulk transmission. Um, but in addition to bulk transmission, we can see that the interconnection requirements are also greater um, the further out west California procures its generation. Um, and that's in the lower level protections that's marked by wind primarily. And then the higher level, siding level three and four in both part west and full west, we see that that contribution also significantly comes from solar installations. Um, so transmission does require, uh, does increase with geography and environmental protections. Um, and in this next step, what we did was we took the outputs of the capacity expansion model and um, we basically modeled their uh, land use footprint. Um, so we can see spatially where the projects are most likely to be developed. And we used a heuristic that I um, is noted here. We did this by minimizing the total land area, um, which effectively maximizes the resource quality. Um, in that in our case that basically means maximizes the solar the insulation as well and the wind speed um, and minimizes the distance the nearest tra transmission line um, and these are two siding uh, criteria that is often used by developers so um, getting higher up on the interconnection queue and um, in reducing levelized costs effectively so the maps I'll show you here are those build out maps for each of those scenarios that I described. So there's an in-state siding level one, um, two, three, and four. So as you can see, there's a trend of solar being developed um, in the southwest of the state in the desert and into the Central Valley and in this more extreme scenario, um, even up to Northern California. Um, in the part west, we can see the same maps. Um, so I'll just step through them. One, two, three, and four. Um, so the main trend is that uh, most of that solar starts to fan out into Arizona and the concentration of wind in New Mexico and um, Pacific Northwest also starts to fan out, become less concentrated. Um, those trends are now going to be uh, even more pronounced in the full West scenario. So this is one, two, three, and four. So that concentrated wind that you see in New Mexico and Wyoming um, gets allocated and reduced uh, to Pacific Northwest and some in Idaho. And there's a lot more uh, solar development in Arizona and California and even Utah. And finally, we took those footprints that you saw there um, in previ those previous maps and we performed an impact assessment on various uh, land use and land cover types. Um, for the in, in the interest of time, I am showing just the agricultural lands and rangelands, um, uh, though we did this assessment for many other land cover types, including those high conservation value and ecological um, land covers and land uses. So uh, to give you an orientation of, of this figure, the, the same three panels for the three geographies. And uh, on the x-axis for each of those panels, you see the same um, increases in land use protections going from left to right. And then on the y-axis, instead of selected capacity, um, we here show the square kilometers of land use for each of those tech, uh, wind and solar technologies. Um, so everything that you see that's dark, darker in color, so the dark orange and the dark blue 
show air, um, the amount of land area that's impacted for that particular row. Um, and that row corresponds to particular land cover types. So on the top row, it's prime farmland. Um, on, in the bottom row, it's rangelands. So the overall takeaway from looking at this figure without examining every bar in particular, um, we can see that about a third to a, a one half of all solar capacity um, could be located on agricultural land in most scenarios. So we do see dark orange in almost every um, bar in, across all of uh, land cover types and across all geographies. And that um, the, the impacts are significant for both technologies. So though I pull out the numbers for solar, we do see a lot of dark blue for uh, wind as well. And this is important to note. Um, so hearkening back to that motivation slide, we're already starting to see solar development restrictions and conflicts on farmlands um, and we anticipate that this will only um, worsen unless there are policies in place to um, mitigate those impacts and or um, allow co-location or agrivoltaic. Um, this is an overview of the framework that I was describing earlier. So what is a spatial electricity planning framework? Um, what does it look like to actually integrate land use barriers in energy planning? Um, I won't go into details on this, but just to use this as a way to highlight that um, what we currently see in an IRP process is in orange, and that's the integrated resource planning process as an example um, that California uses and many other states. Um, it typically uses just a supply curve that's non-spatial and uses a lot of other uh, demand side and supply side assumptions, puts it into a capacity expansion model and produces non-spatial um, outputs. What we've done is we've taken that um, as the heart of the IRP process and made um, a lot more, get, pro provide a lot more spatial specificity to that the modeling assumptions and we use those outputs and provide a lot more spatial specificity to those outputs in order to do um, ex post analysis um, that will enable other stakeholders including land use manage, land managers um, and environmental organizations and even communities at the county level to be able to engage in some of those modeling outputs um, because they're spatially specific. And so quick summary of those the key findings uh, from the study that could be very useful um, learnings for, uh, for other cases in the US. Uh, we do find that it's possible to conserve natural working lands to meet and meet energy targets, but um, notably there are significant land use requirements. Um, and the note to put the numbers in perspective here, they are approximately double the historic um, land use conversion rates in California. So that's primarily from urbanization. So we would effectively be doubling that in order to meet renewable energy goals. The land protection and both land protection and geography, so out of state availability, does affect technology costs and thus should be considered early in the planning process and as part and parcel of the planning process as opposed to um, after. And third, in the absence of a plan to limit impacts to scale up renewables, the impacts to natural and agricultural lands could be significant. Um, so it, we can anticipate the possible impacts and uh, we can also model what it would look like if we mitigated or avoided those impacts. And um, finally, we find that regional access is actually a very important conservation and cost strategy. Um, and that California and other states should continue engaging in um, regional energy trade. We find that generally the message is that integrating more spatially explicit conservation data in the energy planning process can encourage solar and wind development in the lower impact areas and avoid some of those siting conflicts that we anticipate. Okay, so to wrap up, um, this is just a very high level um, set of messages. Um, and I, I wanted to leave you with an analogy 
um, though imperfect, um, I, I believe does capture more, more or less the essence of um, the role of spatial planning and siting in deep decarbonization. Um, that planning climate solutions without land use planning is like playing chess without a chessboard. Um, and that's because we really need to know where the pieces go um, in order to strategically come up with solutions to avoid conflicts um, and to make renewable energy an opportunity as opposed to a threat. Um, we do find that signing barriers are very important challenges for cost-effective rapid renewable energy development, though we need, do need better quantification of um, those signing barriers in comparison to other barriers. Um, in the case study, we find that that renewable energy could be a threat or an opportunity, depending on how it's managed, and that a spatial planning framework can be developed and integrated into existing planning pro energy planning processes. Um, just a couple of slides on recommendations, uh, some food for thought for decision makers. Um, we re definitely recommend that these the maps that we produced for the western states um, be replicated for other states planning low carbon transitions so having environmental and social risk maps are critical for um for getting this process this land use and energy planning integration process started um, and with the, this integration um, planning integrated planning we can facilitate zoning of large-scale renewable energy development and that helps to streamline transmission and generation planning. And that's important um, as with the figure that you see on the right, uh, that's because there's a chicken and egg problem with, uh, with generation and transmission planning, that it takes much longer to build transmission than it does generation, but it's hard to figure out what should come first. Um, and so zoning helps uh, basically align these two different planning processes um, within an in integrative resource planning framework. Um, and it will help that if once the zones are in place that the zones allow pre-approval permits on lower impact sites, they reduce that we have lower land costs and plan transmission for development on those lower impact areas. And we expedite permitting for transmission upgrades on existing right of ways as opposed to entertaining um, new right of ways for every new project. Um, and importantly, um, though I don't mention in the motivation, um, but the chapter goes into this, the social backlash issues are also increasingly important. And we find that in the literature that if communities are engaged in decisions, especially in compensation, um, a lot of those conflicts can be avoided. Um, and finally, we find uh, that agrivoltaics could be an important strategy. Um, and that's because, or agrivoltaics, or um, siting renewables on uh, net working lands. That's because 80% of the Great Plains is actually cropland, pastureland, or rangeland. And the Great Plains is, is effectively the wind hotspot you know, for the US. And cropland is typically located on fat, flat, sunny, and accessible areas, which is also prime suitability for uh, ground-mounted solar. Um, and that agrivoltaics takes really can have um, major co-benefits and that really should be um, investigated further. Uh, trans in terms of transmission planning, uh, where we don't have economic incentives, we really should have policies in place that really can drive further transmission buildout because it is such a critical component for achieving those renewable energy buildouts that you saw on those maps. Um, so we do need to do a better job of allocating costs for long distance transmission because that's what, what we'll need a lot more of. Um, we need to address any jurisdictional overlap issues um, for those long distance lines. Um, and that there could be a role for the federal government to establish authorities that help rule on any inter interstate disputes that um, is currently lacking. Okay, so with that, i um, happy to wrap up and take questions I, um, through the chat.
Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, that was incredible. And it's so exciting to see that we're actually starting to make progress on really thinking through these critical issues, especially with the rapid decarbonization and expansion that we all know we need to do over the next few decades. Um, so uh, we did get several questions. I've tried to organize them a little bit here. Um, I'm gonna start with one just based on the recommendations and your summary that you just finished, um, specifically on the social backlash. Um, Peter Ellis asked, he was basically framing it in the context of the, the UK situation. So years ago, it was much easier because of the overwhelming public support to reduce emissions and expand renewables, that it was easier at that time to do onshore wind siting. Um, and at, more recently with the more conservative government, it's gotten more challenging and the public support has waned. So I just was asking, given the technocratic focus of the processes that you've described, um, mm -hmm. how are you secu securing or sustaining meaningful public consent, either within this project or elsewhere in the Nature Conservancy? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, it is a very, admittedly, a very technocratic process. Um, though it is a public proceeding, so IRP is um, by design um, meant to incorporate public engagement and community engagement, um, but it's imperfect because you still have to have resources to be able to engage in the lengthy IRP cycle um, and the Nature Conservancy as well as many other environmental NGOs like Defenders for Wildlife, um, uh, Sierra Club, those are, these are all parties to uh, California's IRP. Um, but so it is through those particular channels that have the resources and time to be able to engage with the assumptions. But uh, what was lacking before this framework was developed was a way for communities to understand where infrastructure lands on the ground um, in each of those portfolios that are very hotly debated by energy planners. And so what we've effectively done was provide a way for those uh, communities to be able to say, these are areas that we think should be off the table for development. Um, so it's very much in a, much, in a spatial uh, manner that we have tried to improve the process. Um, those recommendations are uh, about social backlash and compensation are not truly uh, well suited for an IRP framework. They're really much more what are policies that are ancillary that would um, facilitate implementation um, as opposed to being directly associated with improving planning, um, and, but are still very highly critical. Um, but I, I believe that trying to get community engagement earlier in the process by providing a much better idea to communities, at, um, particularly at the sub-county level, of where infrastructure should be cited um, and where there's a lot more conducive or willingness for society, for communities to accept certain types of projects, knowing that ahead of time and being able to incorporate that into planning and, and reflect that in the terms of energy costs, system costs, is going to be extremely important because it's currently not at all being considered. Absolutely. Um, so, and we also have a few very technical detailed questions on the actual modeling work that you did. So I'm just gonna try and get to those really quick. Um, one from Susan Mikado, she asked, do your regional numbers take into consideration the energy needs of other states? That's also a great question. And we um, get that question a lot um, because it is a very California focused study. Um, yet uh, we look at procurement from out of state. And the short answer is no, we don't, um, not explicitly with the Resolve model, but we did a back of the envelope to assess whether or not the resource maps that you saw at the er, um, in the earlier part of the presentation on availability in all Western states, whether that would be sufficient for uh, if all the other 11 Western states in the Western interconnection also had similarly ambitious targets as California. And we find that it, the answer is just barely using a back of the envelope approach. Um, and, and that only assumes that those states adopt a similar 
high electrification pathway. Uh, and so just to give you a rule of thumb uh, approach, um, estimate, California's demand is roughly this equivalent of all the other 10 states in the, in the West. So it's effective. We could double the numbers that you see in those slides and, and be able to get the um, capacity requirements for the rest of the um, 10 states. But we are doing a follow-up study um, actually with Evolved Energy to look at this very question, to look at the demand and ambitious targets for all the 11 states and, tr and be able to get you a better, much better answer to that question. Well, that's exciting. Then also the states can have a really helpful, uh, productive conversation based on that as well. Um, also on the model, there was a question on whether the model includes solar thermal as well as solar under your solar category. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Solar thermal included with the PV? Um, no, the solar, there's no solar thermal. Um, I'm assuming that's the... Per, uh, question is referring to CSP, which is utility scale. Um, there's actually no CSP in any of the current models because they're non-economical, non-economically competitive with solar PV um, to date. Great. There is also a question um, about rooftop solar versus utility scale solar and what the role of that is here. That's a great question. Um, and in the slide deck that I shared, there is a slide showing the results of our uh, rooftop PV sensitivity results. And I just, I didn't mention it in the presentation itself. Um, but we did look at a high uh, a um, BAU versus a high adoption of, of behind the meter PV, which is primarily commercial and residential rooftop PV. Um, and we find that um, at a high penetration, we can avoid uh, some utility scale solar development, but we still, 80% of um, the capacity still comes from utility scale renewables. So, um, of course, distributed PV has a role to play, uh, an important one, because for every um, marginal installment of solar, of rooftop PV, we can avoid some ground mounted but ultimately it's still in, um, insufficient for meeting California's targets, even in the high adoption scenario. I'd be curious too, to see if there is some kind of um, consumer behavior or social benefit also to having a more rooftop to make it more socially acceptable to have also large scale ground mounted. Um, Emmanuel also asked, um, what was the grid resolution of the study used in the study? We used a, um, for all of the raster inputs, uh, so those are the gridded inputs uh, were at 250 meters, and then all of the environmental and ecological data sets um, are in their native uh, feature class or vector resolution. So we used uh, basically whatever was given to us in raw format, we used that particular resolution. So it's the, basically the highest resolution we could have done the study in, we used. What was the sources of much of your data um, across the different um, layers that you described? Um, they, so we actually have, that's hard to uh, generalize because there are about 200 data sets that went into those maps that you saw on the, the siding levels um, and they are, all listed in the appendix for the paper as well as the, in the report. Um, but broadly for um, citing level one, so that's the uh, legally and administrative, uh, one and two, so legally and administratively protected, a lot of those are government data sets. Uh, so either Bureau of Land Management, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Park Service, so a lot of those are federal lands or state lands. And then in categories uh, three and four, the, a lot of those come from a variety, like very, a variety of sources, um, some of which are conservation NGO provided. Um, and so as an example, their category three has eco-regional analyses that the TNC conducted for many parts of um, our study area. 
but yeah, the whole list is, and with links, um, most of that data is publicly available and the maps themselves aggregated are all also publicly available for download. Um, if you follow the links on, and I'm happy to provide those links too separately um, to the journal paper. Great, yeah, we'll make sure to include that in our follow-up email as well. Um, another question, so this, um, this exercise focused very heavily on wind and solar, but as we all know, there are other technologies in the decarbonization story, um, including negative emissions efforts, which also require uh, land use. Um, has that kind of, has this kind of land use planning been done for other technologies, specifically negative emission technologies in other parts of the country? Um, and if not, will the Nature Conservancy be looking into that? Um, not that I am aware. So amongst the ne negative emissions technologies, the Nature Conservancy has conducted a very, um, one of the first studies for the US on natural climate solutions, uh, which does include uh, a large part of which is reforestation and other kinds of land management strategies like extended rotation and uh, wetland restoration and grassland conversion avoidance. Uh, that has been mapped uh, and, but it is not, it's a technical, techno-economic potential analysis. It's not truly um, looking at opportunity costs or allocation of those strategies across the landscape to meet a particular target. Um, so nothing the, um, that's the equivalent of what you see on the energy planning side exists for other negative emissions technologies. Um, there have been separate technology specific studies like on, on bioenergy, um, BEX in particular, looking at uh, where we could be uh, procuring um, biomass feedstocks for a certain amount of uh, maybe like a gigaton of emissions reductions from uh, BEX. But uh, there hasn't been a holistic planning framework for all technologies that have land use implications for deep decarbonization. And that's, that is what's missing. What I've shown you here is just for the electricity sector. Um, there hasn't, there's nothing that encompasses all other major land use um, requirements from other technologies. Um, in your work, Grace, ha have you come across other uh, case studies or countries or examples of this kind of very detailed land use planning tools um, that we could share? We have a pretty global audience on with us today. Um, I haven't seen anything that does the, what we've done for California. So that's why we've wanted to establish a more generalizable framework. Um, there have been other, the studies that I had mentioned earlier um, at, in the motivation slide, looking at the United Kingdom, they have um, coarsely restricted land and looked at those cost impacts in a capacity um, expansion type model. Um, so that's the closest equivalent study um, outside of the US that we are aware of. And so, so for the most part, this is a very underdeveloped um, and area uh, topic and very much right for um, innovation and a replica expansion into other areas. I, I, I think that this is critically important um, now that we, tr we have a better sense of the scale of renewable energy to development that's required and the landscape, possible landscape impacts in particular places. We, I do think that that's real motivation for trying to understand whether those possible impacts could be true in other places. Um, and a related question is the, uh, the models that you referenced, are they publicly available so that uh, other researchers could test or try to apply them to different data sets? Um, the capacity expansion model that I we used is publicly available, and that's um, because it's the state of California's official IRP decision support tool. Um, the all of the spatial modeling tools are also available, so that's um, it's not in a off-the-shelf format. But uh, the code, the 
basically the code to do the analysis is all available online and it's associated with the journal paper. Um, I can also send a link to share um, that will is basically a tool that does the resource assessment. It's called the MapRE um, zoning tools that I helped develop and it's publicly it's free and publicly available. Um, so I will send a link to that. But the methods are all very um, it laid out in detail in the both the journal paper and the report and the links to the GitHub repository that has all the scripts is also available. Wonderful. We'll, we'll have to make note of all of these links we promised and make sure to include them in our email. Um, I'll ask one final question because I think we're at the hour here, um, but um, it's about offshore wind so the prospect of increased offshore wind to kind of take some of that load off and reduce our land needs has that been considered at all um so that's a that's also a really good question um they are not in this particular study for california and that's because we used the version of resolve that does not have offshore wind in its supply curve um, and that was primarily a decision made by um, California decision makers and, and parties, mostly because uh, offshore wind is a, um, the resource characterization is well, not well developed. Um, but in the next round of the IRP, it will be. And uh, when we do the West Wide study, uh, we, we will include offshore wind as well. And we do think, mostly because we do think it'll be a critical uh, for like pressure release valve for the land use sector. Um, but as you can see with some of the results on the very first slide from um, uh, Jim's study for SDSN, uh, the, the fraction, the proportion of offshore wind to onshore wind is still relatively low, even by 2050, due to costs. Um, so there's going to still be a tremendous role for uh, onshore wind, and uh, it would be interesting to look at how land use restrictions could possibly change that uh, relative proportion of those two technologies. Absolutely, and that's a great segue. Um, so that report that Grace mentioned and that she actually referenced also in this paper will be published later this summer, uh, mapping out seven different scenarios of getting to net zero by 2050 in the US um, through a national study. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Grace. Uh, we'll make sure that we follow up with all of our listeners here um, in an email with all of the links we promised and another version of Grace's paper. And then please do get in touch with her if you have other questions uh, so we can all continue to share our learned experience and make progress on this challenging but super important issue. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.